would like to uh, acknowledge my last principal in this district, Dr. Barbara, Barbara Malsby Springer. If you would come uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, madam. Woo. This has a mind of its own. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on with our agenda as printed, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, school board member Emily Booth Masters. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of Coach Tony Doris. He was a 1981 graduate of Goodlettsville High School. He taught and coached in Metro, first at Lytton, and then for 22 years at Goodlettsville Middle. He was a staple in the Goodlettsville community. He loved children, and he was committed to their success. He was a very generous person and always willing to help anyone in need. In the words of his longtime colleague, Mr. David Brooks, he had a great relationship with his students and he was known for always helping anyone in need. Blessed with an outgoing personality, he was a friend to many all across the Metro system. Goodlettsville Middle hopes to memorialize him in a very meaningful way in the near future. They're talking about how best to do that. He is going to be greatly missed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now time for one of my favorite parts of our meetings, public participation. We thank you so much for joining us. We thank you for taking the time to come and present your concerns. Uh, with safety measures as they are, we are asking that each speaker only take two minutes. At the end of that two minutes, you will hear, and that unfortunately will be the end of your time, and we ask you to exit through the emergency exit to the left. My left, your right. Um, with that being said, if you wouldn't mind listing, or do you want to list those? It's okay, I'll call. I think you called several notes. Okay, so you'll see, thank you. You'll see the list of, uh, where the order of the list of participants. I'll call on the first three, please be ready. Miss Cecilia Prado. Okay. Mr. Johnny Epstein. Thank you for your patience as we get ourselves in the flow of things, being back in person. But since we have some dead time, thank you all so much for your hard work. What do you say? All right. Greg Jones? Christy Mayo? Gotcha. Good evening, my name is Christy Mayo, and um, I appreciate your time tonight. Um, I am the parent of a fourth grade um, elementary student and also the parent of a uh, junior female athlete. And um, first of all, let me say thank you for allowing our students to get back on the field. That was really important for them. Um, but it's also equally important that um, the parents be allowed to be on the field and to watch our students play. Um, we have um, been missing film footage. I know we were told that um, each game would be live streamed, but that is actually not the case. Um, after you pay the live stream fee of $70 um, for the season, you quickly find out that the cameras aren't necessarily manned and don't move from place to place. So you don't actually see your child. I haven't seen my child yet. Um, on the film footage as she's the goalie. So we're not seeing that. So we're missing that opportunity to capture that 
crucial um, film footage that we were told we would be able to get with the live stream. And um, the other issue too is that the Titans Stadium has opened back up for fans to attend games. We're in phase three. So I also believe that um, based on that, the fact that the city's opened back up to phase three, that parents should be allowed to attend their students' games safely. We, we can adequately socially distance. We will wear masks to do that. We are obviously outdoors. Uh, Metro's own Dr. Jahanger has said that outside is the best place to be. So it should be safe to, um, to watch those games. Um, I, back to the film footage issue, um, we were at Cane Ridge last night and we were um, actually run out of the parking lot, couldn't even sit in the parking lot um, in our cars. Um, we were also told that that game would not be live streamed because they had no one to man the camera. And Cane Ridge did broadcast their football game for the boys, the boys football team last week. And I feel confident that they will do the same this week, but our girls soccer team didn't get that same opportunity. So to me, I feel like this is violating um, our girls title nine rights by not allowing um, us the same opportunity to get that film footage that the boys football games are being offered. Um, so also despite the teacher's best efforts to educate our children virtually, it is not the same as in-person um, learning. Um, my children have um, complained that they are not, um, they don't feel like they're learning what they should be learning. They're not learning what their friends and their peers in other schools throughout Metro are learning. Um, is my time Thank up? you for your time, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg Jones. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Felicia Lively. Thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. I'm sure that several of you have heard my name um, over the past couple of weeks um, as my daughter is a Hillwood senior and um, we were devastated when the call was made that parents couldn't attend uh, the game. So I have reached out to Dr. Schaefer. I've talked to several board members, so thank you for the ones who talked to me. I personally asked to, um, I've called Dr. Battle's office numerous times as well as left messages for her secretary. I did not get a response from um, her secretary. I think I heard from Dr. Battle once. I wanted to just state my opinion. Um, I've never even been, Jasmine's a senior. She's an AP honor student. Um, she does cheerlead and dance ensemble. I can honestly say this is my first time stepping into the board, but I feel like uh, parents should be able to go and attend the games. I don't mind helping take mass temperatures. Um, I don't mind with any of that. I feel like we went to a Sumner County game and we live in Gillettsville. And so we drive our daughter to everything. We're very active parents, um, my husband and I. But when you can go 10 minutes over to another county or drive down to Davidson Academy past our church, and those kids are playing football, we should be right there and be able to support too. It kind of makes it seem like county schools are being punished uh, just because they're, you know, they're, our kids are in that. I get the numbers thing. I work in the medical field with anesthesia, so I understand COVID. We've wore masks, you know, I, I would do whatever I can. I just feel like we should be given the right for our parents' voices to be able to support our kids. And the fact that we were told we can't even like sit, step foot on the parking lot, when we drop her off at these games, it's like security 501 out there. They are watching license plates to make sure you're not staying out there. And it's like you're like a hardened criminal, which is so uncalled for. And I just feel like we, are, we shouldn't be treated that way. I felt like, and I even told Dr. Battle, that I felt like we should be at least given the opportunity, meet us halfway, let the parents sit 
in the parking lot. I feel like so many parents would have been okay with that, but they're just like, move in and move out, and they're watching people. I just wanted to share, I was the mom who started the petition. Uh, that's why I started it, because I really just wanted uh, our voice to be heard. We have almost 1,700 signatures. I just wanted to share a few comments from some of the people. Um, one guy said that he's a coach. He's like for Metro. He's like, I've seen the work these athletes have put in over the summer. And even into what should have been the regular season, just now saying, just short, you can't do anything. Sorry, I guess that's my time. It is, but thank you're welcome you. to come back in November. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. Next speaker. Dr. Battle and Board. My name is Nicole Corey and I'm a parent to three children, two of which are enrolled in MNPS. I am a certified pediatric nurse practitioner and I've practiced for 12 years in the Southern Hills area. I have hundreds of patients that are MNPS students, kids at Tusculum, Glenview, Valor, Cane Ridge, Una, just to name a few. As a mom and a pediatric NP, I want to advocate for not only my own children, but for all of my patients and their families. I've been writing to you since July when the decision was made to return to school in a virtual format only. I was furious then and I'm furious now that uh, that the, of the injustice that kids in MNPS have suffered compared to their surrounding county school friends and private school peers. Why did we refuse parents a choice in August when the majority of parents then wanted an in-person learning in some format and so very few children were ill for, from COVID? Why did the leaders of our city, task force, and board forget to put the children first when making decisions for our community? From a medical perspective, I'd like to share what is concerning to me about these kids. Since April, I have tested and treated kids for COVID-19. I do not think it is a hoax. I will not say that a complication won't occur. I've had children test positive from three months old to, to 19 years old. I've had kids with mild symptoms and mostly with none. They come in to be to be checked because a parent or an adult in the family has had it. <clears throat> um, I will not say that we will go back to school without any issue, but we have to try. Since quarantine, I lost a patient to an accidental drug overdose. We now know that um, Nashville has a 47% increase in fatal drug overdoses in 2020 compared to the first six months in 2019. I've referred, referred numerous young, previously healthy children and teen teenagers to counselors and psychiatrists for depression and anxiety, the youngest being nine years old. I have had to weekly follow teenage patients for chest pain related to anxiety. I've had to encourage multiple upcoming seniors from dropping out of school because they have no, because they have no faith in themselves or their support system to do the virtual school. We now know MNPS has had over 1,100 kids drop out this quarter. I have watched several of my patients with autism redress, regress dramatically due to having no in-person therapy since March. I have had to change the way I practice as for the past 12 years, I have preached over and over again to limit screen time to two to three hours a day. And now I have kids Excuse gaining me. 30 pounds or more. Thank you for your time. Okay. Please feel free to come back in November. Next speaker. Good evening, distinguished board. <laughs> it's kind of strange seeing it like this after being here so many years. My name's Tony Griffey. I'm with the IT department here at, at Metro Schools. And um, back um, several weeks ago, um, I woke up in my sleep and I was really disturbed about a lot of things. And of course, we all look at the news and all the stuff that's going on like that. And um, I, got, I woke up in the middle of the night, it was about two o'clock, and I sit down and wrote this letter. And, and the next day when I got up and I started reading it again, I kept thinking, I need to share this. 
And so I just wanted to bring it here and share it tonight. And it's really just my heart more than anything else. So my father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Dear God, I know that you hear me and I want to take a few minutes and speak to you about something that has troubled me for a long time. I was raised in this land where I was able to attend church, and it was there that I first learned about you and your love for us. As I grew in knowledge and understanding, I learned how you had led many people years ago in a pursuit of freedom. We call those people our forefathers. It was an amazing story about how they turned to you in all their ways of le for leadership and guidance. They even crafted this country after your tenets and laws. It became a glorious thing to behold because of the choice they made to follow you. You loved us as your own and you gave us prosperity and strength. You showed how we were living in error in many ways with our fellow man and led us in the pursuits of your love for us all. We became a nation that feared you and understood how important high moral standards meant to a successful democracy. Although many times the way was so very difficult and pressure from all sides came against us, you continued to keep us in your love through the tough times and easy times. As time went forward and we became a country of prosperity, we became drunk on the power and the deceitfulness of the riches that you had blessed us with. You could see that we were slowly falling away from your love as we chased after the things that gave us pleasure. We were slowly losing our way and turning our back on your love and care. Our technology was becoming our new dream. Our wisdom was taking the place of your eternal wisdom. Our knowledge, although it seemed right at times, was taking the place of your love. We started thinking that we didn't need you anymore. So we took your love for us out of our public schools and took your love for us out of our courts and our government. We didn't want to see the signs of your love anymore. Although we turned a blind eye and a deaf ear, you could see the results of our choice as we slowly chose death over life. Because of our choice, chaos now reigns over righteousness. Killing reigns over life. Our limited knowledge reigns over your eternal wisdom. Our entertainment reigns over our need for you, the one true God. Our greed for more of this world reigns over the peace that you alone can give, a peace that surpasses all understanding and takes us through all difficult times. Thank you so much for and sharing with see. us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next speaker, please. Hello, how are you doing? Hello. Can you hear me? Perfect, all right, I'll keep my mask on. Hello, I'm Erica Perry, um, and I'm a concerned Nashville resident and a graduate of Metro Nashville Public Schools. Um, just wanna say, we can save lives and honor the healthcare needs of educators and students, and meet the needs of students if we listen to people uh, most impacted by this problem, the people who are most marginalized, uh, people who are most impacted by COVID. And so that would be black folks, that would be Latinx folks, that would be working class people. And so I just wanna lift up the demands of uh, educators and teachers who would be most impacted if we move too quickly uh, to go back to in-person classes. And so some of those demands are um, small classrooms, adequate PPE, adequate ventilation, and most importantly, the choice for every educator and family to stay online until they feel safe to return to in-person without losing their jobs. Does that make sense to y'all? Good. And I also wanna just uh, name that right now, my friends and uh, family members um, who are teachers and educators and support staff are currently preparing their wills because they fear that if you make the wrong decision today, it could cost them their lives. And I wanna make sure y'all feel that and that y'all uh, understand that and that if you make a decision that you honor that, that our lives are actually on the line. Um, and so we know that a failure to listen to people who are most marginalized and most impacted again by COVID-19 uh, will only deepen the already harsh impact on our families. And so already, already so many members of our families and our community have lost their battle to COVID. So many members of our family and community have been separated um, by COVID, experiencing economic crisis. Um, and so I wanna ask y'all to make the right decision. And, and I think we start with honoring uh, the demands of teachers, of support staff, of educators right now. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, address you all. Uh, I'm a, my name is Greg Jones, first time parent of a Metro Nashville Public School child. Very excited to get her back into school. She's a freshman at Hume Fogg. I would just ask you guys to put yourself in the shoes of a young woman going to a new school where she doesn't know anybody uh, and the uncertainty of when they're going to go back. The reality is this virus is gonna be with us for two years, maybe even longer than that. And uh, there's, there is risk associated with everything. We need to manage that risk, but we need to get these children back into school. The, she will do fine. We have the means and the ability to go support her, but the education gap is only going to get worse by not having these children in school. These high school kids have been out almost a year uh, by the time they go back in January. So it seems to me we could find a way to get some children back, start schools, you know, maybe not bring everybody back, bring one grade at a time, some way to get these kids acclimated so they get these, the social interaction. It is heartbreaking to see her every day up there uh, without the ability to, to make friends and, and meet people. Uh, and then just, just would add just a, a very minor point, but it is, it is just, uh, just so uh, just flabbergasting to me that they're gonna let people into the Titans game and you will not let parents, let two parents come watch their children play sports. That makes no sense other than that is a slap in the face because you didn't wanna let these kids play sports to begin with. There's no rational reason that two parents can't come watch their children play sports. Thank you very much. Thank you, please exit to the right. Next speaker, please. Uh, hello, I'm gonna keep my mask on. I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Cassie Norton. I live on Airwood Drive in 37214. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of statements from people who didn't feel like it was okay or safe for them to come in tonight. I hope that's all right. This one is from an MNPS parent. She wrote, I'm a single parent and the thought of working in an environment in which six or more feet is not guaranteed, plus my health is in jeopardy, I wanna be alive for my child and I need to be healthy for my child so they're taken care of. The possibility of contracting COVID scares me because my child could lose me as their parent if I contract COVID and die. More importantly, I have the potential to bring a deadly disease home to my child, a deadly disease, oh sorry, and I do not want my child sick or dead from COVID. Returning to school during a time of high COVID cases and the flu season is irresponsible thinking and careless action. Teachers should not have to choose between life and death when virtual learning is available for students and we're making it work. And then this is from an elementary school teacher in the Southeast Quadrant. Uh, I'm asking someone to read this on my behalf since I am high risk and I do not need to be in large groups of people. I'm writing for those of us who have been classified as high risk through the third party process, yet we've been told we must come back to work in the building. We've been proving that we can work virtually. We've performed our jobs well thus far in the virtual setting. The new mandatory training video pushed out by the district states in one of the modules that high risk personnel should be able to work from home if possible. Really, your own training video is in conflict with the actions of the district. We are risking our health and our lives. We have served this district. We serve our students, but now there's no one looking out for us. Just think about that. What will happen with one of us dies? Is it worth it when it doesn't have to happen? And then just for myself, I'd like to say that I'm pretty lucky in that I'm relatively young and don't have any previous conditions, but a lot of people get sick from this and end up having complications that weren't expected or have long-term health effects. And that scares me. And it scares me that my students could end up with that. I don't want them to have like lung problems for the rest of their lives because we went back and we didn't need to yet, or we didn't make sure to take every single precaution that we could to keep them safe. We're treating it as if we have only two options and one of them is a failing virtual model and one of them is sacrificing teachers and staff, grandparents who are raising their kids, students with medical conditions. Those aren't the two options. We can keep working to make virtual better and we can wait and we can make it safe to go back in person. We have to be creative and use our imaginations and not just fall for this trap that there's only bad choices. And I know that you all care about students and families and teachers and that's why you do this. So please make the right choice and do not sacrifice people because that's, that's not the value that we have in Nashville and I don't wanna see that happen. Thank you. Thank you, please exit to the right. Next speaker.
Hello, my name is Victoria Gordon, and I'm speaking on behalf of John Little today. I'm a Nashville parent, a Nashville Propel parent leader, and I stand here as a parent of an exceptional learner, and I had to become my child's teacher and behavior support as a result to the abrupt shift to virtual learning. I stand here before you with the list of demands for my classroom. Every student needs to receive an individualized learning plan and, become, and properly assess because critical achievement gaps are widening now due to COVID. A visualized education plans does not include the learning loss that our kids, that our kids received before COVID, and it's definitely not a, re not a recipe to make a struggling kid as well. Every student needs access to district issue devices with the appropriate software preloaded and working as well. Better, uh, better connectivity with the hotspots for each family. Virtual learning needs to be meaningful to each and each and every individual student. This program was designed for the average student in mind. Unlike most, I do not have the average student in my home, and so this makes learning very difficult for us. We need less distractions from teachers in Zoom meetings. Parents are providing a quiet, safe place for our kids in our homes, and we need the same in return. We demand you to help parents to be more actively engaged and support our children during virtual learning. This is new for all of us and we need support, not to be talked about. We need a plan. If this pandemic continues throughout the school year or longer, are we prepared? My child is enrolled as a sixth grader on a third grade math level and a second grade reading level with the inability to spell and type in via chat with his online teacher is a bit much. I did not plan for his education to happen this way, but this pandemic made me aware of the current status at home. I mean, this kid came to my school in my class this way. We need options. We need to be given the choice to do what we feel is safe for our households and, and the kids at the same time. We ask that we be a part of the decision making. Since we are our kids' first teachers, whether it is virtually or in person, we need to be able to make this call, not just you, because it's our kids, their lives, and education at stake here. I have a son. His name is Malik Gordon. I'm his behavior support. I need help. School inside is not working for us. When you're going to come and meet me and say, I will give you everything that you have, that you guys have, as a as a way of doing, because if we was in, if we was in school, it'd be a list. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. My name is Torvis Gardner. I have a parent, I'm a parent of a third grader, and I'm a National Prepare parent. National Prepare stands for parents requiring our public education to lead. But while you're leaving, do not leave the parents out. As parents, it's, it's our duty to make sure our child is safe and cared for. This includes a quality education. Before December 2015, there was a no child left behind. But somewhere in between now and then, the parents have been left behind. The parents have been put in position as moms, dads, providers, and substitute teachers. Like regular teachers, we need to know where our kids' educational struggles are, what grade level they're on. Can the child add, subtract, multiply, divide? As parents, we know how we were taught, but with this common core, it don't make common sense. I have talked to, thousands, to hundreds of parents, and the words I often say, when will MMPS listen to the parents? When will our voices be heard? The parents should have a voice in the virtual learning and education. We have major issues dealing with the COVID-19, but let's summarize some of the issues that I hear daily. Technology, Wi-Fi connection, no charger, no one-on-one -on -one support, no tech support, hotspots not working, Zoom format, online assignment instructions, can the child access the material? These are all creating increasingly rapidly digital divide. Learning loss, one size fits all education is not gonna help the spring, summer, and the COVID learning loss. As parents, we know how we was taught, but not the kids at home with us, if we teach them the way we teach them, is there gonna be a, a homeschool learning loss when they go back to school? Nobody's listened to the parents, and the parents need a training on the new format that came out. They don't know about Google Classroom, Schoolology, and these different things that's going on. 
They can't find the assignments. They don't understand the assignments. Then you have parents that have um, four computers with one charger. So in closing, something needs to be done and we need to uh, listen to the parents because the parents are the ones that's home with the kids. And with our parent manifesto, we have a lot of parents that signed it and we should work together with the teachers, the kids, and the students to create a plan that's going to close this uh, learning loss. Thank you so much for your time. Next speaker, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shanka Dugare, and I am a Nashville Propel Parent Leader. I just want to begin by acknowledging and thanking Ms. Sonia Dobbs for taking time to talk to parents about exceptional ed services during Propel Speaker Series. It was very impo uh, info informative and gave parents an opportunity to ask questions for cl uh, clearance, understanding which leads to better parent to school partnership. I am a mom of a fifth grader who is an exceptional learner. Currently, he is failing all but one class this nine weeks. I know the grades don't reflect my son's ability or intellect, but more a reflection of how the transition to virtual has devastated many of our kids. Kids who were already a part of communities at academic choice and technology deficits. That is why I'm in support of Propel's call in our parent manifesto to close the digital divide and ensure every household has access to high-speed internet. We've heard from parents concerned about their exceptional learner doing work neither the child or parent understands. For many of our kids, the one-on-one -on -one supports and specialists help give them access to the curriculum. My son had so many missing assignments, it was overwhelming for us both. To know no matter how hard I pushed, he needed more critical supports and adjustments to level the playing field. I connected my son with the after school program where I teach so our middle school teacher could support him in understanding and completing his work. There was only so much we could do in the allotted time considering my son's needed pacing. What does a parent do who, do who doesn't understand the virtual work or how to work the computer good enough to help their kids? How far will our kids fall behind in these kinds of learning conditions? What is the plan to ensure Florida curriculum supports all learners, including exceptional learners? Our manifesto pushes for quality, academic choice for parents, including in virtual settings. A one-size approach, unfortunately, leaves behind our kids who need the most. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Please exit to the right. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Sonia Thomas, and I am the Executive Director for Nashville Propel. I live in the 37207 zip code. Uh, as you've heard from parents who, are, who represent our most struggling communities, uh, many families have unique needs, uh, and they have encountered significant challenges during the pandemic. While COVID-19 has exposed the disparities in our school system, these gaps will only continue to worsen if we do not act with a sense of urgency. Our children are suffering. We have repeatedly asked our school leaders to address the digital divide, as you've heard, which has left many of our children without access to devices or internet connection so that they can participate in virtual classrooms. We have called on school leaders uh, to address learning loss, yet we do not have a plan to recover our children. Our children continue to fall behind. 
And while so many families may be ready for in-person learning, we must place safety first without compromising equity. This means that we are not punishing families who opt for virtual learning and ensuring that children will continue to access the same quality education uh, as their peers in the physical classrooms. Families across Nashville have different needs and we will only support the well-informed and well-intentioned decisions grounding in, grounded in providing equitable outcomes. We cannot continue to approach the challenges we are facing with a one-size-fits-all mentality. It is this approach that has left so many children behind. This is why we are urging the school board to consider allocating the necessary funds that are needed to help children make up for the learning loss. Also, on behalf of every struggling community and our families, we are asking that you please talk to us, listen to us, because we know what's best for our children. We need to start working together to course correct before we end up in another crisis within a crisis. As we stand here today, we know that some families are still unsure even after committing to a decision between in-person and virtual learning. If they have made the best decision, this is why working together, families, it's, it's crucial that families and the schools work together and that the school's system um, earns the community's trust, assuring us that you are putting the needs of children and their families first. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is Andrew Record, and I teach at Apollo Middle School. I'm here because I want to know that I did everything in my power to prevent needless harm. I'm going to read two statements from teachers who couldn't take the risk to be here tonight. The first is from a literacy coach at AZ Kelly. She says, I have loved my career as a teacher and the, and the literacy coach serving students in Title I schools for over 16 years. I never imagined having to choose whether to leave our wonderful district. Dr. Battle, I support you and your leadership. You as a quadrant leader and I work together completing literacy rounds, and I gain respect for you and your commitment to students. My family is considered high risk. My husband has a rare, rare lung disease. My daughter has an autoimmune disease. When I was confronted with returning to school, I followed all the MNPS procedures. My doctor wrote a letter indicating that I was high risk. I completed forms to workplace safety, and I received approval accommodations from the third party. I was relieved and hopeful. Then I learned that the process that seemed so equitable was not. Building principals were allowed to make the final decision on which accommodations would be allowed. The decision was determined that I may not remain virtual. Students are always first and foremost, yet my family is also my priority. I truly cannot jeopardize losing my family to this virus by returning to school, but I want to continue to teach and serve MNPS students and families. The second statement I'm gonna read is from a middle school teacher in the Southwest Quadrant. Dr. Battle, you have the power to keep students and educators safe by not reopening schools at this time. I've dedicated my life to public education for over 18 years, and I never thought that I would have to sacrifice my health in order to work. I am categorized as high risk. I'm fighting not only for my safety, but the safety of those who are my world. I have often put my career over my family because I have been so dedicated to my students. However, this time around is non-negotiable for me. I have an elderly mother and in-laws that remind me that everything is at stake for me. And while they're not currently living with me and my husband, they rely on us to run errands, assist them with housework, cooking, etc. They each have underlying conditions. The thought of exposing the coronavirus to my family, knowing the possible implications that it would bring, is unfathomable. This would be reckless and unforgivable. Dr. Battle, I ask that you find it in your heart to allow educators and students to remain at home safely until we have a handle on this virus. And I just want to add for myself that at the end of this, I think y'all will be judged not by what you said, by what you did. <sighs> Thank, Thank you for your time. You. Also, Thank pay you. Armando, please. Next speaker, please.
Ladies and gentlemen, of uh, ladies of the board, uh, Dr. Vattel, forgive me, it has been a long day, it's been a long week, it's been a long year. Um, I have, my name is Amanda Kale, I'm the president of the Metro Nashville Education Association. Um, I have worked with your team, Dr. Vattel, and many of the people in this room to try to make sure that our schools are both safe and equitable. And that is what we are dedicated to as MNEA. But things have been very, very difficult. And, you know, as I've gone and I've spoken to my colleagues around this state, one thing I have learned is that MNPS has been a leader. We have stood out in the state of Tennessee as the district that has done it right. Um, I can't tell you how many times other association presidents have contacted me and said, can I get a job in MNPS? Um, these are presidents of other local associations. And so it's hard to be here tonight and to say, I don't think we're going in the right direction. We've been set up with a choice and the choice is student needs versus employee health. And that's not, a, that's not an equation we can win. That's not an equation that's in the end gonna serve students or anyone. You know, we need to do at the end of the day what is best for people's health and safety. Because at the end of the day, kids aren't gonna teach themselves. So I have submitted a petition to you it's been signed by over 500 teachers, school employees. Um, I've emailed it to you. Um, and I'd like to just share a little bit of what it says. We have been given a false choice and we reject it altogether. We choose neither to accept the current state of virtual learning nor to risk our lives by returning to unsafe school buildings. Instead, we want to remain virtual and expand virtual learning into a system that works for everyone. In light of the recent COVID-19 outbreak at the Cora House School, we are asking for the three demands, these following three demands to be met immediately. One, MNPS must remain virtual and expand virtual learning into a system that works for everyone. Accepting that virtual school will leave some students behind or demanding that students and staff risk our lives by returning to unsafe school buildings is a false choice. No one should be forced to risk their lives to pay bills or receive an education. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker. Hello, Dr. Battle and school board members. My name is Susan Norwood. I've taught at McGavick High School for going on nine years, and before that, middle school. This is my 14th year to teach in MMPS. I wanna tell you how the pandemic affects me and my colleagues. First, I'm gonna read a statement from a fellow teacher who could not be here. She says, we know how the Cora House School had to quarantine, but what about schools that we don't hear about? Tennessee School for the Blind was closed because of an outbreak. Nine teachers contacted COVID-19, large yellow caution tape, X's placed on doors screaming, do not enter. I cannot vouch for that, but I'm sharing with you what she said. When will we realize that this illness has taken us hostage, that it's not safe for any of us to be in close, poorly ventilated quarters and that doing so can result in death? When will we realize that this illness can be deadly when students contact the virus and die and the lawsuits begin? When teachers become ill or die or infect their family? It's not safe for us to return face to face. Maybe you haven't had to attend a triple funeral because of COVID-19. Maybe you haven't had a relative placed on life support alone, fighting to live without the physical support of their family, to live through the nightmare only to have their body produce blood clots and have a stroke. Some schools are hotbeds for COVID-19 because of their poor ventilation. Please take a stance, a stance with educators for their lives, for their careers, for their families and students. Stay virtual. That was from my colleague. Now I'm returning to my statement for myself. 
I just wanna say that I'm over 60, but I'm not yet 65, and I'm getting mixed messages, I believe, from the district. I just took this PD from Vector, and one module says it's not safe to teach if you're over 60, and yet another one says if you're over 65. Well, I would like to know. I'll be honest with you, I also have hypertension, and so no, I, I don't feel safe going back into the building. Um, let me tell you about my classroom. It was obviously never meant to be a classroom. It looks like it was carved out of storage space. I have no windows. I have some kind of heating and air conditioning unit that looks like the robot out of Space Family Robinson. I, I don't even know if it ventilates the air. I can tell you we have chronic heating and air conditioning problems. That's not your fault. We're underfunded but it does affect me and it does make me afraid to teach in my classroom where I'll be teaching classes of 30 students three times a day for an hour, all breathing the same air. What do I do if they don't wear their masks? Um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm just, I, I won't talk much further. I'm just gonna ask you, please protect your workforce, protect us teachers and other adults in the building. This virus is not under control. The numbers are going up and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Oh, I'm sorry, please exit to the right. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Cecilia Prado, and I am a co-director at Workers' Dignity, a worker center led by working class people uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and has been fighting on the right side of history since 2010. The thing about public, the public school system is that a big portion of the working class interacts with it in one way or another. Uh, the members of Workers' Dignity are workers, teachers, parents, and students. An overwhelming number of them have been hit hard by the pandemic. You know, they have lost their jobs, they have contracted COVID due to the negligence of their bosses, um, they have endured countless wage theft, abuse, and uncompensated injuries uh, while being called essential. And when it comes to the school system, our members who are workers, teachers, students, and parents don't feel listened to. And as an organizer that has dedicated her life to the pursuit of justice, freedom, and democracy of my people, for my people, I feel concerned because listening is essential to democracy. You may remember Armando and his team, for example, who renovated McMurray Middle School and have been claiming $43,000 for their work for over 13 months. The company that managed the project offered them the money if they signed a contract of silence, which would prevent them and other workers to know of Armando's story. They would have never known to watch out for Orion, um, and most importantly, they would have never known that they hold more power than they think they do, and that like Armando, they too can fight back. Instead of listening, you chose to dismiss him. You chose to listen to David Prophet and you gave Orion a multi-million dollar contract. Uh, and fun fact, uh, you did listen to David Prophet, the director of facilities, who is in the advisory council of Love Helps, a nonprofit organization which Orion is a major contributor. During the pandemic, the lack of listening became more apparent. For example, our member Beatrice, who had to come up with her own tutorial video in Spanish for how to use a Scholastic. In a sense, uh, it, due to the lack of available resources in Spanish for ESL parents. After the video, she became a leader among the Latinx MNPS parents who were desperate for those kind of resources. According to Beatriz, she and other parents are petrified of COVID. Uh, not only uh, they, there's lack of appropriate healthcare for the Latinx community, but we're also collective and we often live in multi-generational households. So if one person gets COVID, the grandma gets it too. Latinx parents don't want to get COVID, but virtual needs, uh, virtual school also needs to get more accessible. Some working class parents are paying out of their own pocket for Wi-Fi, and that ain't cheap. Uh, when they try to voice their concern to Ruben de Peña, for example, the coordinator of equity, who is supposed to be the intermediate between Latinx parents and NMPS, at best he dismisses his concerns. Uh, when teachers, I don't think I have to tell you how obvious it is that they're not being listened to. And the thing is, when I look at the statements online, I see that many of Thank you are you concerned about returning back to school Exit to the and right. don't think it's a good idea. So who should we speak to? Please come back in November. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker to the right, please. Ben Interpreter. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Armando. 
Uh, good afternoon, my name is Armando. Disculpen por incomodarlos nuevamente. I'm so sorry to make you uncomfortable again. Pero estoy aquí nuevamente, ya casi 14 meses por lo mismo. But I'm here once again, almost like 14 uh, months has passed, uh, and I'm saying the same thing. Yo quisiera hacerles una pregunta. I just want to give you a question. ¿Ustedes están a favor del robo de salarios? Are you uh, in favor of wage debt and corruption? ¿Por qué le dieron un contrato nuevo a Orion? Why did you give another contract to Orion? En vez de obligarlo a pagarme antes de darle un contrato. Instead of, for example, um, make him um, do right, do the right thing before you give him another contract. Todos ustedes, incluyendo a Rubén de Peña, han hablado de que Orion trató de pagarme. Está bien. Uh, all of you, including Ruben de Peña, have said that Orion tried to pay me. That's okay. Pero nadie de ustedes, ni Ruben de Peña, han dicho que Orion quería que yo firmara un contrato de silencio. But none of you have said the fact that, like, um, Orion wanted me to sign a contract of silence. ¿Por qué? Porque yo sé que le deben a dos personas más. Why? Because I know that, at the very least, they owe two more people besides me. Entonces, ¿eso está bien? Que sigan debiéndole a la gente? So is that good that they just keep owing people money and you just keep giving them contracts? ¿Y que nadie podamos hacer nada? And that literally like nobody can do anything about it? Yo quiero saber solamente si ustedes van a apoyarme de favor a que me paguen o en su defecto díganme si no permítanme demoler lo que no me quieren pagar. So I mean like what like what are you with your moral logic like should I just like be able to take back the school that I built? Tengo casi 292 personas que están dispuestas a ayudarme a demoler. Yo, yo no quiero hacer eso, pero lo único que quiero es que me paguen. Están ya uh, haciendo uso de las instalaciones. I mean, you're already using the installations. Like, how is that ethical? Entonces, ¿podrían hacer eso entre Orion y yo? Que lo obliguen a pagarme antes de que haga algún proyecto para MMPS. So could you just do that for me? Could you just like make him pay him before he does a project for MNPS? Eso es todo y gracias por escucharme. I think that's it and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Kelly Graff and I live on Glen Rose in 37210. Um, I'm a teacher, a middle school teacher in Southeast Nashville, and I'm here to read a statement um, written by another teacher from that area who is not able to be here today. I am terrified by the prospect of returning to school. I have two teenage daughters who are both high risk. We have all been staying in our home full time since March, only leaving to pick up groceries. We have been careful to follow guidelines to keep safe. And now I am losing my ability to keep them safe because if I don't go into school to teach, we won't have a place to live. If I do not go to school, I will have a classroom of students to monitor, and I will be unable, if I do go to school, I will have a classroom of students to monitor, and I will be unable to follow the social distancing guidelines that are necessary to ensure our safety. I am scared of the airborne virus and disappointed that my life and the life of my children are going to be risked before there is proven method developed of keeping my family alive. MNPS is too big of a school system with too many children, too many employees, and not enough space to keep us safe. There are too many variables, fall break travel, lack of testing, indoor spaces that don't allow safe distances. I have spent 80 hours a week working to make my virtual classroom a sustainable way to present student engagement and learning. Now that is going to be taken away from me. I feel helpless and hopeless. Um, so that's the statement from there. And in my experience, um, most of my students who I've been working hard with all quarter, who I've been teaching how to do online learning, because they are staying online and I'm going on person, I'm losing that. I'm worried that they chose to stay online because of the relationship that they had with me, because they felt comfortable and safe with me as their teacher. Um, I'm worried that once this shuffle of teachers happens, though I have great faith and love for the teacher who's going to be taking care of them, I'm worried that they're going to feel betrayed. I wept when I was not going to be able to see my students again last year, and I feel like I'm abandoning them again this year because of this needless shuffle. I wish that we could stay safe. I wish I could be with them, 
but that is not what's safe right now. I wish I could be there to support them in every step of this way, but that's not feasible. They have parents who could die quickly from this virus. My best friend who is 25, who has no comorbidities, contracted COVID on a military base that was locked down and has had it, has had extended um, COVID for two months. She's had symptoms and has not been able to work. So this can affect young people, new teachers. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Melvisha Dotson, and I currently don't reside in Nashville, but I work in Nashville. Um, and I'm reading a statement from another colleague. It says, from a high school teacher in the Northwest Quadrant, the fear of being exposed to a virus, the United States just can't get under control is scary. I was sick at least eight times last year when we, were, when we weren't in a pandemic. I think it's very unfair to let some teachers remain virtual and force the rest of us back to take a huge risk with no real choice. I want more than anything to teach in person because it's easier on the students and the teachers, but only when it's safe. I'm very comfortable that the health department, I'm very uncomfortable that the health department changed the way they report in conjunction with the announcement to open schools. It appears to me that this was done to manipulate the positivity, positivity rate. It went down two to 3% once they made the change. It doesn't look good when we are seeing the same thing play out in our government in Washington, D.C. with the CDC. For Metro to say temperatures won't be checked is irresponsible. We have students come to school sick all the time every day when we weren't in a pandemic. Do you think this would change? Many teachers are at their breaking point. What's the plan when teachers have to quarantine because they're already stretched thin? Almost every time a teacher called out last year where I work, we had to split classes. Do you think that this sounds insane? Don't you think that this sounds insane in a pandemic to add more kids to an already overcrowded classroom? The area, I'm sorry, there aren't that many subs in normal time to an already overcrowded classroom. There aren't that many sub, I'm sorry. Please follow the science and don't fall into the trap that seems to be plaguing America. Data is what we rely on so heavily in teaching. Why wouldn't we ignore the scientific data? So for myself, as a 29-year-old African-American female who has high blood pressure, who's asthmatic severely, I know y'all can hear me breathing hard in this mask, um, to, to be told that I'm approved for accommodations, but there's no spot for me because I'm only certified to teach one subject. So I'm getting forced into the classroom when I've done all the protocols, all the steps, the things that you asked us to do in order to get those accommodations. But then still, I'm told, nope, well, we don't have anything for you. You can either go back into the classroom or go out on leave as a first year teacher. So for me, it's really hard to feel like I have to choose between life and a career that I love, that I've waited so long to get into. And I just hope that you guys will listen to our concerns and hear our concerns and take the time to look into how we can make everything safe for everyone and not just pushing our kids back into the school. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, my name is Todd Cassidy and I have three MNPS students who attend Glendale Elementary. I'm a native Nashvilleian, a business owner, a former board president of the Nashville Film Festival and a COVID-19 survivor. I'm also a member of Let Nashville Parents Choose, who, as you know, has not agreed with the board's lethargy in giving MNPS parents the choice and opportunity to send their children back into classrooms. But instead of debating all the specifics in two minutes, I'm gonna address two things that I think are of utmost importance as we as a community continue to face COVID-19, the future and leadership. Yesterday, the New York Times published an article that outlined many points um, that should give all of us some perspective and frankly some hope regarding the future. For example, there are promising treatments being implemented, including monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies. Scientists believe that the FDA will grant approval for at least two vaccines by January. Experts also believe that there's a potential for all Americans to be vaccinated by next June. So even though we're in the thick of dealing with COVID-19, the future is not as bleak 
as the public, media, the public and media hysterica, hysteria might lead some to believe. That, will there be challenges and setbacks as we collectively work together uh, and work our way through this pandemic? Of course, you know, it's not gonna be an easy journey. But we cannot stop moving forward because moving forward will obviously get us to the end of all of this. So to you, the MNPS board, I simply say, don't freak out. You have been elected to lead and the process of leading is the process of moving things forward. I get it, it's tough making hard choices in uncertain times, but that's what leadership is. Leadership that I've seen from Fran Bush, who has listened to her constituents and heard what we had to say and joined us as we try to push things forward and give parents the choice. Dr. Battle, I've watched virtual school board meetings that have showcased your grip on this board. Um, it's borderline impressive to see how you've been able to control the tempo and, and move things forward as you see fit. So that's why I want to speak directly to the board and saying that know that we at Let Nashville Parents Choose have been listening to all of you and we will continue to do so. We will also be watching and speaking out. We expect leadership. We expect forward momentum. And most of, most of all, we expect all students K through 12 to have the choice to be back in classrooms before January. You guys can do it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Jasmine Lively and I'm a senior at Hillwood High School. I'm here this evening to advocate on behalf of the, of the high school students of Metro National Public Schools as we are feeling unheard during this time of uncertainty. Over the weekend, I reached out to my peers to see what their concerns were with virtual school and with us going back in person in January. To start, I would like to address that the narrative of high school students adjusting better is completely false. Many high school students have reported having too much work for one student to handle. And this has caused them to become overwhelmed, overworked, and overstressed. This amount of work is causing many students to have extreme amounts of stress and it's leading to anxiety and further depression. Many students have reported reaching out to administration and teachers, but no one has helped or tried to fix the issue. Many students struggle with ADHD and ADD and the lack of school and the lack of in-person school has led them to have not enough stimulation to let them focus and have them get good grades. I respect your decision to not put us back in school. We just wanna make sure that there is a plan in place to get us the help that we need to succeed and get good grades as we have to stay out of school as it is the safest option. Second, I would like to address our issues with or our concerns regarding returning in person in January. Many high school students are concerned with class and hallway safety. Our classes are oversized and to where it's nearly impossible to social distance. And we wanna make sure that there are plans to keep us safe in the hallways as our hallways are overcrowded walking in the hallways. Finally, I would like to address the topic of letting fans into sports. I know this has been a hot topic for the past couple of months, and I understand why it would be best not to keep, to keep us out, but our city is reopening. And I think it would be fair to let us reopen too. Football season is closing, and if we don't have fans for football, then we probably won't have fans for basketball. And two months after basketball ends is graduation season. And how can we assure that if we don't have fans for basketball, we won't have fans for graduation? I just wanna make sure that our senior year and everyone else's year is good for them. Again, I respect you guys' decision and you are doing the best you can, but I'm just trying to advocate on the concerns that we have. And I know that I cannot be put in your shoes, but I hope you will take these concerns with, a, I hope you will take these concerns and consider them. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Next speaker, please. Sweetie. Go right ahead. 
Good afternoon, my name is Dan Bush. I am a senior at Hillsborough High School, and I'm here to speak on behalf of not only just myself, but as well as my fellow classmates at Hillsborough High School, as well as across Metro. As a student, especially as a senior, I do believe in safety, of course. You know, I do believe in, you know, make sure everyone's safe, but also am concerned with, you know, how students are learning virtually, especially with how, you know, there's a lot of students struggling with, you know, even learning within the classrooms. You know, they wake up, you know, brush their teeth and just log onto a computer, right? And as a student, you know, I, and I speak on behalf of my fellow classmates when I say a lot of us are not virtual learners, but more like visual learners, as well as, you know, I also believe that they should reopen school before January, not after January, because not only would that be too late, that would be too deep to you know, flu season, as well as, you know, cold weather. So I do believe that we students should go back to school, you know, sooner than later, especially with how, you know, kids need to bring up their GPA, get their credits in before graduating, as well as, you know, enjoying being a student. You know, of course, not everyone likes going to school, but no one has really been learning, you know, virtually online. You know, because when I wake up, I wake up, brush my teeth with my little brother up, and all we do is get on the computer. You know, there's really no learning from that. Of course, we're at home safe, but I do believe it could also be safe within the classrooms, you know, social distance the desk. You know, making sure the students have their mask on, sanitizing the chairs, you know, the desks, the tables, the materials the students are using to make it a safe learning environment within the school. I really do hope that you take this down into consideration as in, you know, letting students back into the school as well as allowing students to actually learn, you know. Sure, they're not, you know, going to have the same privileges they did before, you know, do the same activities as before, but I do wish that y'all would reopen school before January and after, you know, so we could actually enjoy being students as well as learning. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Dwayne Bush. I am the husband of Fran Bush. So my thing tonight is a little different than other parents. As a, um, as a husband of a school board member, I see what has taken place during this whole pandemic. And it's not been good. Um, we had poor planning, first and foremost. We had plenty of time, just like the rest of the district. The schools are in our, are in our own city. David lives school, easy hard around the corner for me. They're in school, they've been in school since August, doing it right. And our kids, our metro kids, are either not good enough, or I don't know what the deal is with, with the way the board come up with your decisions. I have two sons left to go to metro. I have five total, five boys. I have that senior just walked out the door, and I have a, um, a high school freshman. And the fact that they cannot go to school, but they see their friends on the other side of the aisle go to school, playing sports, went to the sports, we went to go uh, play for David Lipscomb. They had a temperature check at the gate. We put on a mask when they sat down on the X. But we can't do that in our own district. Last week, my son, my freshman son, who I've never missed any of my kids' events, I missed his first event. And last week, he scored his first touchdown as a high school player. I missed that. And then he made a, a, a block on defense that made his team score a touchdown. And I missed that too. He told me, Dad, he said, that was the weirdest feeling to turn around the stands and you weren't there, to do our little hand thing that we do every time we score a touchdown. That to this day hurts. But even more so what's, what's, what's this hard is that being with Fran every day, she gets so many phone calls, emails, text messages. 70% of them are not from her district. The same parents are saying the same thing. The only reason I reached out to you, Ms. Frank, because you were the only one who seems to care who wants to fight for us. My district, my, my school board member, doesn't return phone calls, emails, no communication. That's the reoccurring thing. And with this school board, I know how it is. I know it's kind of hard making bad decisions. Some of you all are not built to have your name drugged in the mud. You're not built to have your picture on the front of a magazine and an editor in chief dog you out. Or be the topic of a discussion on 92Q where prominent men, black men, are only dogging out a black woman for doing her job. We did it in the last admission, uh, uh, administration, and we're doing it with this one. All we're doing is saying yes to everything. You gotta, you gotta have a voice. Let these parents and students know you care. 
That's what everybody here was voted for. Not to just say yes, yes, yes to everything. Have an uncomfortable conversation sometimes. Say, you know what? Because there's no way everybody in here thinks it's okay for our kids to go back to school in October. And then my seniors can't go back till, what, January? They got out in March. This is the longest spring break in history. We had plenty of time to plan this out. And we wasted, we wasted precious time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is Bill Elder. My address is 3913 Cambridge Avenue in Nashville. I'm here today to add my voice and ideas to the effort encouraging you to reconsider your stated January start date for high school's return to in-person learning. I sent an email to the board um, a while back and thankfully uh, received an email back from Dr. Battle. Thank you for that after which I gather the main reason for the decision to put high school reopening off is that the age group, is that that age group statistically spreads the virus at higher percentages than younger groups do. Uh, this concern is based on the Emerging Infectious Diseases article published by the CDC, which basically said that 10 to 19 year olds have higher transmission rates in their household, meaning if they bring it back to the house, a higher amount of people in their house would contract the virus than if their parents brought it. First, nothing about that statistic will change between now and January, or any time in 2021 for that matter. And with that understanding, my further response would simply be, do all as you can as a school to keep students from contracting it there so they don't bring it into the household. Making schools safe will have to be of primary focus in January as well, so why can't this happen now in high schools, as it is obviously having to happen in elementary schools as we speak? The difference between mid-October and mid-January as far as what we will need, what will need to be done to protect students and teachers from contracting and passing on the virus is nothing. My urging here is based on the belief that we're going to be living with this pestilence, the virus, for a long time, and our schools, just like our communities, businesses, and other institutions, have to find a way to actually be schools during this time. Actual schools, not virtual ones. For our kids' education and their mental health, before we even talk about the social and emotional setbacks this has caused, they simply have to get back into their classrooms. Safe classrooms, safe hallways, gyms, libraries, lunchrooms, stages, auditoriums, all of which can be accomplished. All these things will have to be made just as safe in January as they would have to be now. So why not now? My wife is a teacher at a Nashville school that did bring all of their students back. Operational and safety guidelines were established and implemented, as was a plan to deal with what happens when someone tests positive, which will inevitably happen and has happened. But because of the new guidelines and parameters that they established, outbreaks are staved off and the entire student body continues to receive in-person learning, which all would agree is better for our children than virtual, especially ones going almost a year without being in school. Maybe you can allow individual schools to make their own determinations about reopen. You have already committed to a hybrid method where families make their own decision on whether to send their kids to in-class learning or stay remote. Why should this require waiting three months if the parents that have decided to allow their kids to return clearly understand the risks and have chosen to have faith in their administrators and staff to be able to create safe environments for everyone? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Right on the button. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Hope Hall. I live at 1300 Clayton Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a teacher. I'm also a parent of a MNPS student. Um, I'm a longtime em teacher employee. Today, though, I am reading for another teacher, another colleague of mine who cannot be here because of her health concerns. So this is from Mary Bond at Antioch High School. I am a high school teacher in Metro Nashville Public Schools. I have been incredibly proud to be an employee of MNPS as Dr. Battle made the difficult decision to begin our school year virtually. It was an incredible feat for teachers, administrators, and students to pivot to online learning, distribute thousands of laptops, and teach and learn in entirely new ways. Although there have been difficulties, and this is certainly not an ideal learning environment, we have been finding success while keeping everyone safe. In the announcement of the reopening plans, I have deep concerns about the health and safety of my colleagues, our students, and their families. 
We have been told that the HVAC systems were up to date when installed, but given no update on their current functionality. We have been told that it is not possible to socially distance in classrooms or on school buses, which flies in the face of CDC guidelines and negates the COVID-19 training that recently teachers were required to complete. We are told that students refusing to wear masks will result only in a dress code violation, which is not a deterrent for many of our students. I have been a proud employee of MNPS thus far, and I want to continue to be. We should not reopen schools until all guidelines are ensured. That is what we owe to our students, our families, and our school community. Thank you for allowing me to read that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Matt Malkus, and I'm an Inglewood uh, Nashville resident. Much focus has been placed on how to safely reopen schools in the presence of COVID-19, but I'm here to ask a different question. Is it safe to keep schools closed? Remote learners are struggling. In Texas, 30 school districts have recently announced an end to remote learning. Several of these districts have reported that 40 to 70 percent of remote learners were failing at least one course. In their announcement, the Jacksonville, Texas School District says in part, quote, we feel that remote learning has not been successful for the majority of our students. Absenteeism may also be an issue, pr particularly among poor and disadvantaged students. In two separate studies, the Dallas Morning News and Los Angeles Times both reported across 125 school districts in two major cities that, quote, the more affluent the district body, the more likely that students stayed in contact and engaged. And this has borne itself out in Nashville as well. If indeed remote settings are depriving these students of a full and proper education, the ground loss may be long lasting. The Brookings Institution, a national think tank in Washington, DC, points to research which suggests that during a normal summer vacation, students' achievement scores decline by one month's worth of school year learning. And they ask, quote, if the summer slump affects students in just two months, what impact might the COVID-19 slump have on children who are missing as much as six or more months of in-person schooling? Finally, here in Nashville, this week's Nashville scene highlights another risk of school closures with an article titled, How the Pandemic Has Affected Victims of Child Sexual Assault. They note that, quote, offenders are likely spending more time with victims due to our response to COVID-19. And they relay one disturbing anecdote about a student who, quote, used the pretext of needing tech support to go to a Nashville middle school and report the, her abuser to staff who notified authorities. While this student was quick on her feet and able to seek help, how many others feel trapped without a trusted school staff member or administrator to turn to? In closing, adults have always made sacrifices to ensure the well-being and proper development of our children, and we must resolve to do so now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Keely Price. I'm the librarian at Fall Hamilton Elementary, um, but I am going to read a statement from Adrian Neal at Amqui Elementary. According to the CDC, I have three markers for high risk of contracting COVID-19. I've followed my doctor's advice, social distanced, and followed MNPS's request for continuing to teach virtually. I've been assigned to work virtually from the school building. I have also been assigned duties that will cause me to interact with about 100 children each day and was told that virtual teachers will cover the class for in-person teachers so that they can have lunch. And we're told that in the event that a teacher is absent and no substitute accepts the job, children will be spread out among the teachers in the grade level. What part of this is virtual? Families were given the option of remaining virtual and I was not. Why is my family, my life, not any more valuable than this? I have a family member who is high on the CDC high risk list. I make sure to take my medications, but I know that the stress of returning to school, especially with all of the above mentioned school building expectations is causing some symptoms to flare back up. These symptoms are dangerous when you are trying to control them using medicine and the medicine starts to become ineffective. My hope is that my message as well as the others are understood. 
I don't want to contract COVID-19, but these current actions are putting me directly in its path. What is the plan when the healthy teachers become too overworked and tired and start to become ill? What happens then? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. My name is Ch uh, Chiranthani Simanasekara, and I teach at Nashville School for the Arts. But I'm reading this letter on behalf of another teacher who can't be with us right now because of health reasons. So I'm going to read now from an elementary teacher in the Northeast Quadrant. I am a high-risk teacher in MNPS. I teach grades K through 4 at two schools. I pull out students from 26 different classes each week. The administration at my schools do not care that I am high risk and still want me to pull out students from every class in the building. During my second accommodations meeting, I explained to them again that I am high risk and pulling students out of different classes to go to my class with a different set of students who doesn't follow the CDC guidelines and allows me to have exposure to every classroom in the building. I was told the students will have on a mask and I will be fine. I have worked for MNPS for 12 years and I've never felt so unappreciated and worthless. I explained that, I, that since most of the students I teach choose virtual instructions, I could teach virtually. I have two children whose school is still closed due to COVID-19. And with me being high risk and all the exposure with my every class in the building, it would kill me. I was still told no, I need to be in the building. So it left me no choice but to turn in my leave paperwork. MNPS told us that teachers would have accommodations and teachers would have a choice. I have not seen any of that. Teachers can't teach if we are dead. So I would like to speak some personal words. Um, I, uh, this MNPS is my second stint. Um, I've only been teaching uh, for four years in my previous life. I was a, I'm a scientist with a PhD in biochemistry and I've worked with bacteria and viruses all my life before coming to MNPS. And I keep track of the scientific literature on COVID-19 on a daily basis. And I don't have any underlying conditions. I'm supposed to be okay with COVID-19, but that's not okay with me. As this teacher mentioned, I would like MNPS to keep their promise that teachers, whether they're healthy or not, have the choice to decide whether they want to go into the classroom or not. Thank you so much for your time. I believe that closes public participation for us. Thank you again for your advocacy and for your time. Please, again, join us in November for the first meeting held on the second Tuesday of the month. Now we will move on to, the cons uh, to governance issues. Do I have a motion uh, to accept the consent agenda as listed? Motion to approve the consent agenda as um, listed on the agenda. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right. Roll call vote. All right. All in favor, raise your hand. All right. We have 742 absent. Second, we have uh, chartering oversight. This is meant to discuss uh, the acceptance of KIPP Nashville Antioch location into the MNPS portfolio or to allow it to become a state-run school. Do I have a motion? What will be the motion? Do I need to make the motion to for approval or what do you want to? You make a motion for whatever you would like to make a motion for regarding KIPP Nashville area. All right. Um, I would like to make a motion to have KIPP um, Collegiate Prep High School a part of MMPS. Put your mic down just a bit. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay. I would like to make a motion to have Kip Collegiate Prep High School a part of MMPS. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Thank you. All right. Discussion? You want me to start? I can. I'm sorry. Anyone can start. Right here. Um, I think this is one discussion that um, I know I personally have struggled with just because for me there's also a philosophical level if the state's going to approve um, or override our decisions as a body that we made, that they should set the responsibility of taking care of that school. Um, the other part of it, if the school is in our district, how do we make sure that we have oversight over that, particularly um, as students are transient between schools, um, because they go back and forth between schools, and how do you make a system um, that helps, not say that helps, a system that, um, that can communicate with one another. And so it's always been this interesting kind of place that, we're, that we are in because given where the state, our relationship with the state and the oversight and um, not always um, adhering to our decisions as we make as a body, but then also uh, adjusting to the mask <laughs> Put it closer. Um, as we adjust to the, as we adjust, um, and then also, how do you have oversight as a school that's in our district that's receiving metro funds? Um, that we also have oversight, um, and so it's always been this this tension, at least for me, philosophically, of how do we do that? Even though we know our own taxpayers, we know the dollars, especially given where we are financially as a school district, where we've been over the last several fiscal years, as we go into the current fiscal year. Um, that the state is not sensitive to that, that they, that there's a, there is a, it seems like there's a thought that we take these decisions, we don't take these decisions lightly, and that we're just doing it out of political philosophy, political expediency, but not what it takes to run in district efficiently and be able to give the students the education that they need um, without having consequences um, fiscally or in the quality of outcomes that we have. And I think we just have to continue to have this discussion of where we're going for this because ultimately it's in our jurisdiction, but then also we have this tension with the state of not re respecting our decision as a body. And so um, the one reason I just wanna have this discussion is to make sure we continue to have this discussion. Hopefully we can have a better relationship with the state discussing this, what does this look like um, from an educational level, from an administration level, from a taxpayer dollars level, from a judiciary level, that we have to continue having this conversation back and forth. So I just at least wanna start off the conversation um, with those thoughts. I'm done. Thank you. Anyone? Just no. May I read? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so I um, am going to vote that we do not um, have local oversight over this institution. Um, my feeling is, is I understand that there's a, a moral pull there. Um, my feeling is, is we've already made our decision as a board. We all said that we disagreed to have this school within our oversight or to uh, allow it to be opened. Um, of course, that was overturned by the state as we have discussed, excuse me, once again, mic and mask, mic and mask. <laughs> um, so I apologize for hitting that for um, the sound quality. But um, we've already made that decision. We've already had that discussion. We've had some really lengthy discussions and lots of great points were made um, within those, whether it was in April when we originally started talking about these schools or ongoing conversations that we've had here on the board floor. So my feeling is, is if we've already said that this is our decision, even though that decision has been overturned not by us, then those people that take that decision and say, we disagree with you and we're gonna overturn it, that's their responsibility now. And so that's the reason why I will be voting that we um, don't have the oversight. I should also say, we already have very little oversight on uh, charter schools already. So it would be minimal for um, any type of potential impact for us of what we could actually get um, done and be effective with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tyler? Yeah, so it's, I was not part of the board when you guys voted on the original um, charter oversighting. And I was in agreement based on everything I read that it is not something that we can fiscally, that it's not something that we can fiscally maintain. And that that was a large reason for why it was voted against. And Despite the fact that the state has decided to overturn it, our finances, to my knowledge, have not changed, have they? 
So we still cannot afford to take over the maintenance and, and the governing cost that it would take to have the oversight of this particular charter school. Is that correct? I mean, it, that's are you asking for it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems to me that if we, we, we receive a small percentage to do the, the oversight of the schools, and what we put out in manpower and, and times from our charter office, from our um, employees and our staff that work on these schools, that ends up costing us way more than what we get. And so if we have not received more money to be able to do that, then I don't see how we can responsibly agree to take that on at this point. Thank you, next. If I can jump up just for a moment, the funding in terms of what would flow to the charter school mm -hmm. isn't going to change regardless of the decision. Just to the extent there was a confusion about that, I wanted to clear that up. So to clarify, it still comes out of our budget, whether the state is the oversight or we are the oversight. Authority. Correct. Okay. Well, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so as I have, this, this school is going to lay in my district. And I have repeatedly said that it's not about being pro-charter. We know exactly what happens when our charters come before us for application approval. And when the state does overturn our decision, um, this particular school that will lay in my district, parents want options. That's what I've always have been about and supported um, for our families in, our, in my district. And this school will open fall of 2023 with about 20, about, well, about 1,200 students. Right now, currently in Antioch High School, we're looking at, I'm sorry, Cane Ridge is already over capacity. They are at 104.1%, and Antioch is inching up at 91%, meaning by the time 2023, and we're not gonna argue about being approved. They're already approved. They're gonna be in the district. They already receive funding. They're gonna receive our funding. Um, and KIPP has been the second oldest charter school um, in MMPS. Um, they already have five charter schools that are already a part of MMPS. Um, they've been here 17 years strong. Um, and I'm gonna ask Chris Henson to come up just for a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm going, I did some research, but I wanna make sure my numbers are right uh, when it comes, yeah, you can come up for me, please. Chris. I don't know what the question is. I got some numbers I'm gonna be quoting um, as far as, um, the charter being a part of MMPS and some of the benefits. I uh, wanna make sure my numbers are correct. Um, one of the benefits of having uh, this high school uh, or oversight for this high school um, is that they have proven track records of ACT scores. Their ACT scores help our district. It helps with our state report card, along with Hume Fogg and MLK, uh, and also Hillsboro has showed a significant increase uh, in their ACT scores. Um, the, the district receives authorizer fees. That's what I wanted you to come up for, Chris, so I can understand the authorizer fees. Um, if I understand it correctly, um, so far from the five KIPP schools, uh, in our district we receive around $175,000 a year and could receive an additional funding of $280,000 a year if the, if the high school is approved. Is that pretty accurate on the authorizer fees that we receive? Sounds pretty accurate, Dr. Thomas. You may have more uh, information, but it, it's capped at $35,000 per school. And so with the number of schools that they have, the math seems. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. And it was one more thing. Um, MMPS also receives Title III funds, which are for our EL um, students. And this money flows through the district, and the money is used for staffing and programming. Is that correct? They do receive Title III funding, as far as I'm aware. Yes. Okay, so we do receive some benefits. It's not um, the amount that we provide per pupil, but we are receiving some benefits back to the district, if that's fair to say. Um, thank you, Mr. Henson, I appreciate that. Um, oversight is just major, it's major. The concerns that um, were raised during the application process, uh, we can make sure those indicators will be met and, and, the following, and, and follow the outcome. Uh, we understand that these applications are not gonna be perfect because it's just, it is a very rigorous process, um, but we can make sure that uh, this school will um, 
um, give the academic support to our students. And I just do believe that these are families that I do serve in the district and they wanted choice. Right now, um, we currently do have a total of 29 um, school uh, charter schools that are in our district that are a part of NMPS. And that is, that is pretty, that's pretty big, 29. Um, most are in um, um, District 5 and District 1. Um, so we have a large number of, of charter schools in these particular districts. So I don't see why this particular school will, would not get the same um, value of being a part of MMPS. So that's my statement, any, any questions? Thank you. Yeah, I have a clarifying question as well. So I too was not on the board when the, when the applications came forward, but I did review the um, original applications trying to understand the ins and outs of it. Um, and I just want, could we get a little more clarification on, um, you know, I understand that even if they are under our purview, we, we don't actually have as much oversight as we would with our non-charter public schools. Um, I just really am trying to understand um, in order to, to choose how I vote as carefully as possible, um, what is the financial difference between MNPS oversight versus the state level oversight? And is, I mean, is there any? You want to come up and explain? I think, um, you know, I felt I like I understood in, in one of our orientation sessions mm -hmm. that there is um, fairly significant nuance there. And I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, remember. <laughs> sure. With the way that the funding works, if they are a, a board authorized charter school, then their funding does flow through all of our financial records and, and through our budget as a transfer to the charters based upon the per pupil rate and the enrollment at the charter. If the charter is run by the state, then that same amount that we would transfer to charters 10 times a year, that amount comes off the top of our state BEP funding before we ever see it. And so it's the same net effect. It's just one is handled in a different way than another because if it's not uh, an MNPS approved charter, it's not part of our school district. And so the Tennessee Department of Education sends that those funds directly to those charter, charter authorizing entities, whether it's the ASD or the State Board of Education. But the net effect in the end is the same. So they, even with receiving that funding on the front end from the BEP, they, they still are entitled to the per student allocations from MMPS, like the additional if, funding? If they are a state approved charter that is not run, that is not part of MNPS, then their funding goes directly to them from the Tennessee Department of Education without it actually ever coming to us. So we don't see it or transfer it to them, but it's the same amount for those charters that are actually an MNPS charter school, except when in that case, we transfer those funds directly to the charters ourselves 10 times a year based upon their enrollment. The state follows the same sort of procedure that we do, except they are sending it directly to the charter authorizer as opposed to it running through our books, through our, our budget. Does that help? Okay, I'm still trying to account for the funding then that, that is appropriated to MNPS. Um, via our Metro Council budgeting process and the you know, the additional funding that we offer per student that isn't actually coming from the state and federal funds. The state takes the entire state and local per pupil amount for the charters that are run by the state. And so it includes all of the Metro local funding as well as the state BEP funding in what they send to the charters if it's not an MNPS run charter school. So it's the same per pupil amount that's going to either group of charters. It's just a matter of the mechanics of how it's done. Thank you. That you finally got got through my head. And Chris, would you also explain if we are not, if they're not an MMPS um, school, um, talk about the Title III funds that we currently receive, and what would happen if the state um, is, is, is this, if it's state ran. 
I'm, I'm going to have to, if it's okay, defer to either Dr. Randolph, if you don't mind, or, or Mr. Clay. The, the federal funds run through the federal programs and mm -hmm. grants office, and so I want to be sure that that whatever said is, is accurate if someone else, or if Dr. Thomas, if you know how Title III funding flows to charters. Okay. The, uh, any federal funds is based on the pure pupil rate within uh, the district, so we would not receive the Title III allocation. It would go directly to the state. Or okay. And the state at that point will allocate those funds directly to the charter. Instead of, if we were to uh, have th this particular charter part of MMPS, the charter, the uh, Title III funds will flow through the district um, to those uh, those two things I mentioned, which was staffing and programming. Is that Currently correct? We currently have two coaches that provide support to charter schools. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we currently have two coaches, uh, Title III coaches, uh, that s um, provide support to charter schools. How much? Place. How much this year did we get for programming fees for charters uh, for the Title III? I I am not for sure. I would have to to look into that. We can find out for you. My point of it is, is that we do receive some benefit back to the district. Um, I just didn't want, I just wanted to make sure I was on record stating that because there are benefits to having um, our charters a part of MMPS. Again, I've stated we have 29 charters that are part of MMPS, which that is pretty big. And um, my ask is to allow this school so that we can, myself or any other board member moving forward can have some oversight <coughs> so that our students and, and families could get the support they need if they need it. Uh, I will say that uh, KIPP, um, back in that day before me in 2015 when uh, KIPP uh, Elementary Middle was not um, voted to be a part of MMPS, um, which I, you know, they, they've done a wonderful job in the district. I have been to the school several times. I've been invited to parent meetings, even though I'm not, um, I'm, I'm the school, school board member in the district and they have literally respected my position and want my input, want my feedback and want my support. And yet they're not a part of MMPS, um, but this school has not received one complaint, not one complaint from one parent. Um, uh, they have a waiting list that is up to 700. Um, so d they're doing everything right. And Randy Dow has been in this community, like I said, for 17 years. Um, he's been a good steward. Um, with his charters, and um, I just um, feel compelled that this, should, this school should be a part of uh, MMPS because there are some benefits uh, to having this school a part of us. So that's my statement. Thank you. Ms. Pupo Walker. Um, I want to just say for the record, I totally respect the dialogue here. I think this is what it's supposed to be like, right, where we're looking at different points of view. and. I voted against this charter with this board when we were facing really serious fiscal crisis, which is still exists. Um, I agree that we have lost some authority because the state overrides us, and uh, I think it's not far in the distant future that there will be a state authorizer that author we just skipped altogether, that the, the charters can go to the state and we're not part of the process anymore, and I have a problem with that. <clears throat> But my, my reason to actually support this idea is, is based in a, a conversation we had when I think it was Rocket Ship that had the same request of us, which was they were approved by the state and then they asked, we'd like to be part of the Metro Schools portfolio. I, I understand we don't get to authorize them, reauthorize them. We don't have any authority over whether they stay open or not. But what I do know from working in Metro Schools is that when we are working with our charters, and I know charter schools that are in our network call our teams to make sure they're complying, whether it's around discipline or special ed or ELL or business processes or, you know. And the other thing I do know is that students go back and forth between charters all the time in, in our schools. And it's a much simpler, better, clearer process when there is communication and partnership between the charter and the district. And I remember Mr. Queen saying, I don't even remember when the rocket ship conversation was, frankly, um, that they have a much closer, they have no relationship with state-run charter schools. They have no interaction with state-run charter schools that are serving our students. I see them as our students. And so um, when our charter office can call up a school and say, hey, we have an issue here, or you know, working on this or that, or can we partner on something? I think that's what it's about. I think these high school students 
you know, that are gonna be at this school. And for me, it's not even about the crowding. It's really about are we gonna, how well can we serve students? How much control can we still have in terms of partnering with this school? Who is a good faith partner? I think KIPP is a good faith partner. And so I get the governance question. For me, it's not even about whether we get the, the Title III pennies that are gonna throw in our way. For me, it's really about are we serving these students better if we have them in our portfolio than a charter commission that frankly I don't have any confidence in still. They have not been able to get their leadership put together. I don't know who, what they're doing. Those are, that's a commission of full-time people. That is not their job to run staff schools. And so I just think we would do a better job supporting this school in our portfolio. And so that's, that's my two cents. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Tyler? I have another question. Um, would the funding that we receive from them be enough to cover an additional staff member to meet the needs of those charter schools from your office? So right now you have two staff members. That support for the EL. Um, the, and my current staff, I have four people, okay. including me. Okay, and then would the amount that we would receive from Title III and from these funds, would that be enough for us to hire an additional staff person? We, I would have to look at the what the allocation actually was to see, uh, and that's actually through uh, uh, the EL services under uh, Molly Hegwood. Okay, because... Thirty-five. Okay, yes. Oh, we only received 35,000, so that would not be... Um, uh, a, a sufficient amount of funds to mm -hmm. to pay for a full-time person. Okay, because that then what that that makes me feel like then your office is going to just be run more ragged and spread more thin between all the different and every time we're overridden by the state and we get paltry amounts of money, your office is asked to do more with less because you're going to have to be serving even more schools. Um, but we're not receiving enough to give you some relief to be able to meet their needs appropriately. So my, my concern is still financial. It's still in the man hours and the actual human interaction that, that our staff already has with the schools. And the more we add to it without the ability to scale up with the help, then we're actually gonna end up doing a disservice to these schools because we're not actually gonna be able to help them the way that, that we claim that we want to because we don't have the staffing ability to do that. Um, so, I mean, it still is a giant concern for me. Um, I would say, um, just to respond to that, um, I, I've said over and over again, um, after doing my research and being a part of the community that I serve and that I live in, where KIPP uh, lies, this school has done a great job. There's not a whole lot of oversight for this particular school at all. Um, they have done a grand job in this community. Again, not to have one parent uh, concern. Um, it's, it's, been, um, it's been enlightening to know that they're doing their job. They're doing what they're supposed to do. And um, to go back to the 35,000, it's 35,000 per KIPP school. It's not just a one-time 35,000. And mm -hmm. again, I know we're talking about pennies and things like that because, you know, it's not a lot. We know it's not a lot. But it is something that I can say that it does come back to the district by having um, the school a part of MMPS. And again, to Jeannie's point, this is about our students. They're still Metro students. They're still Metro students. And we just want to make sure that they're served and making sure that they are moving in the right direction. And it has been proven with his other with the other high school um, that is in District 5, Christian's District, that it is doing well. And that's one of the things that I always have said on this board, that we have to make sure our kids are college and career ready. And they're doing that job. They're doing that job. So not a whole lot of oversight with this particular school in my district. Um, and I'm not sure from the charter's office how much work they put into a lot of the oversight. Uh, most schools we do hear from if there is a problem with charters um, but I just, I'm speaking on this one this high school being in, in the district that I serve and the constituents that I serve and the children that I serve so that's why I feel it's very important I understand and I get the fact that the state overturned our decision I get it but I also have to look at I have two high schools by the time 2023 comes we're going to be over capacity I don't have a school being built out there in Antioch Southeast Davidson County is the fastest growing district in this district. 
and we need to support our families. We need to have, they want choice. And that's exactly what I was elected to do, to be their voice. Um, so to answer to your question, this particular school, just so we talking about this school in the, my district has done a, a grand job on serving our students. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Elrod. Thank you. Um, since we seem to be focusing on the Title III funds, I agree that the $35,000 does not cover the cost of internal work that we would have to do for that oversight, um, as $35,000 obviously does not pay, pay for any additional assistance, whether that be even part-time. Um, also, it's my belief that title funds should go directly back to that school to help make it a more equitable system. That's the reason why it exists. And so I think that it should really go directly back to that school instead of be funneled through us for the benefit of other schools, though it's dependent on the school that those, vital, those title funds come from. Um, I also wanna make sure that I we bring back to point, since we're going back to some conversations um, that y'all were not privy to, but maybe some other people were not privy to from April. Um, though KIPP has, uh, we'll say an okay to good reputation here in town, their entire group, there's been two closures of schools in just Memphis in just June. That was announced in April around this time as well. So we wanna make sure that we have once again, um, the best kind of uh, support that we can for them, but we have said that we can't support them. That was the reason why we decided against it in April. And so if we've already made our decision that we cannot support them, there has been no change. If, if anything, the change has been that we need more support and that we don't have, we're already stretched too thin. And so uh, if we've already said that we can't support them and we've already said that this is not a good fit for us, um, I also think strategically it's a bad move for us, uh, though I hate to talk about strategy. <laughs> I think it's a bad move for us to talk about approving them once the state approves them um, to be a part of us because I think that that looks bad. It makes us look like we don't know what we need or want. Um, and it goes back on our on from April. So want to make sure that we have those discussion points of once again, we've already said that we're not going to do it. Um, to the $35,000, since that keeps being a talking point, it's just not enough to cover the cost of doing the administrative work of monitoring them appropriately. And it appears the state believes that they could do it a better job than us anyways. That's why they approved them more than us. I will say, um, just I'm sorry. back off of that. I'm, I'm going to say something. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. She so wasn't done yet. let me just Excuse say something. Excuse me, Mrs. Uh, I, I'm, Mrs. I, Bush, I got the floor. Better yet, I got the floor. Attorney Robert, I got the floor. Or Mr. Severe, After she finished, I wanted, in, I, wanted I wanted to have a conversation. I wanted to have a conversation. I would like to allow Mrs. Elrod to complete her uh Has she not already statement. completed it? Have you already finished? First of all, you didn't ask for a conversation. You keep interrupting other people. So, no. No, ma'am. So, I want to make sure that we have those conversations and that we are fully aware of the conversations that were taking place in April. So if you'll have any more questions, thank you for asking them. Um, and um, if the title funds are your concern, I would like you to just be more clear on why exactly you think they need to be spent that way. And that would be it. All right. uh, no, I would like to step in to speak for the first question. time. No, that's okay. I'm so I'm in the queue next. There are a couple what? of I thoughts that I had. Considering that I was at Neely's Bend when we were taken over by the state, I've been unfortunately forced to watch a school that I loved, that many of us loved, be offered what I think is lack lackluster support by the state. And so at, in the beginning of this conversation, I was a bit agnostic. Whatever, you know, I, despite what we all think about charter schools separately, if we're just talking about oversight, I remember looking at my students as I walked away from that building not knowing what was gonna happen to them. And so if I could bring our conversation to a bit more of a student focus, my, my fear is that they won't get those supports that they need from us and heaven forbid they are transferred back to a different school, it is a process that is belabored. And I think I, I hear the most uh, from my charter school parents about just if there are issues with them coming back into the system and they've been part of the, the, the state run system. So I want us to consider just that, that it, if we're just talking about how the students are impacted, it's unfortunate that the state overturned our decision, but that's kind of where I'm headed. The other issue that I see well, is twofold. One, we've had many conversations around this table about the symptom, the symptom of what happens when the, when the state board overturns our decision. We have not built a relationship with them. So I'm gonna ask uh, governance chair and advocacy chair if you all wouldn't consider calling a joint meeting so that we can discuss an advocacy plan, a relationship building plan where we actually engage not just the state board, but the state legislature and the state department of education. I don't know about you all, but I don't talk to those people regularly. I barely know who they are. So if we have these grievances, to be frank, it's displaced emotion for us to have those conversations here if they never hear from us. If they don't know what our fears, frustrations, or goals are, they may not even truly understand our financial situation. 
So it might be a good, a good practice to start engaging them regularly. And I have a bunch of different ideas, but of course would love for our chairs to kind of lead that. So we'll talk about a timing for that. Of course, it'll be public, publicly noticed. I would like to make that a bit more of a work session, possibly even a retreat. The second thought I have is that we've never as a board really heard from our charter office until it's time to talk about charter oversight or charter applications. I've been on this board for four years and I still have questions about the committees, about the process, about how that, um, that department is impacted when, when we do offer a new building or a new school. So I would just love to hear from those experts because these are still educators who are experts in charter schools and experts in the application process. They understand the oversight. They have all of the relationships that we have not built ourselves yet. So I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Dr. Battle, but I would love to have a conversation with you moving forward about having some sort of presentation or engagement with the charter office, whether again it's a work session or part of a future board retreat. Because some of these questions, I think, moving forward, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to have charter applications. We're gonna continue to have oversight uh, conversations. Part of it, I think, is once we allow Nashville to see MNPS as the best choice for their children, then we won't have those issues. Because frankly, we're not seeing charter schools pop up in some of our more affluent neighborhoods. They are popping up in areas that don't have new buildings. They're popping up in areas that are overcrowded. They're popping up in areas that uh, parents are asking for other options. So I think part of this also is just as, in, as a committee, I mean, I'm sorry, as a group, making sure that we use that advocacy, advocacy committee to the best of our ability and making sure that parents understand all the good things that are happening in MNPS and how we're looking to partner with them. So with all that said, again, I was a bit agnostic at the beginning. I was just gonna look at, listen to my peers and kind of figure out where I stood because uh, I, I did have, a, um, an educator from KIPP reached out to me and he, she was talking about the issues that are just so much more streamlined when they work with the MNPS portfolio versus when they work with the state portfolio. And I just cannot get the idea of, out of my head with Neely's Bend and having those babies and those parents not really knowing who to turn to and not really having the support that they felt they needed. So at this point, it, it really doesn't matter what we feel about the charter school. You know, we, we asked that they not become part of our system because we felt like we didn't have the money for it, but they're here and they will be serving our students. And so for that reason, I am gonna vote for it, but you do what you do. Any further comments, uh, questions I, or concerns? Yeah, I was just trying to, um, I wanted right ahead, to Bush. Um, just make my comment, just, just for record. It goes back to the students. I've always, I never wavered about the children. I never wavered about um, the options that, that families want in my district. and. Um, and, and to your point, um, it's, it's, they're here. I mean, when, it, when we get them, what do we do with them? I mean, we, we have to do something. And yes, building a relationship is very, very important. Um, but this is about oversight. This is merely about oversight and making them a part of MMPS. And I don't think that's hard, especially that we're already giving them funding. It doesn't change anything. What changes is that we have some input, insight, and be able to walk those halls and those things that we had concerns about in their application, they're going to fix them. They know what they have to do. And they've done that. Um, they have two years. The school is gonna open fall of 2023. Again, this school, it doesn't matter about the numbers anymore because I already know where we are with our numbers with both of our high schools out there. So I do know that we're gonna be over capacity by that time if I don't, if we don't get another school built out there. So this is about children. We want to have options and that's exactly what it's about. They're here. And again, I've already said, we have 29 that are here and you know, we're working with them and this shouldn't be any different. So thank you, I'm, I'm totally done, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Poopo Walker. I just want to point of clarification. It's not oversight. We won't oversee anything. It is strictly a technical assistance relationship where they um, will have processes that are easier for us um, and that we would have relationships with faculty, with community, and there would be more of a symbiotic relationship. We have zero oversight. I think you're right, actually, Ms. Elrod, this, like, we, <laughs> it does send a mixed signal, right, that we, rejected them and then we're like, but you can come anyway. <laughs> and so I get that, but I, I'm, I will still go back to my, I think it's best for students if those families understand, have, a, you know, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a hard one. Thank you, Mrs. Elrod, and then. Okay, so um, 
I, I look forward to what we come up with as an advocacy group and governance group. My opinion is that the, the state doesn't care what we think. Um, or we wouldn't have the BEP litigation that we're doing. We wouldn't have all other kinds of issues that we have right now with the state. But I'm always for trying to get people in the room and let's get some understanding and make a consensus. So I'm excited of how that goes. Um, I would also like to say that to my, I guess, previous point that Jeannie just mentioned, I don't feel like they want a partnership. If they wanted a partnership, they would have done better improvements. Um, they would have come out with us to, with a better application the original time. Um, the partnership that they have requested is the partnership with the state. That's who approved them, not, not us. Um, and so I, I don't feel like there's a huge partnership availability there. Um, and so I guess that's my last word. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Player Peters, and then Mrs. Masters. Um, this question is for Dr. Battle. So, can you clarify? You know, on agenda, we have chartering oversight, and to Ms. what Ms. Pupil Walker said, it's more of a technical. So, I guess, let's say for some reason they didn't meet some ac academic standards or fiduciary standards, who has the ability, if we had to sanction them or close them down, who has the ultimate responsibility if we would approve this? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Griffin to come up to the microphone. I just want to remind us that Dr. Griffin is our chief of innovation. She oversees our MSAP schools, our charter schools, and our priority schools, and she has pretty significant experience um, in doing so. And then um, it may be necessary for Dr. Bellamy or Dr. Williams to, uh, or, or Mr. Thomas, um, to share kind of that additional um, oversight process. We have gone through this a few times. So we have some experience, particularly with some previous um, charter schools and uh, uh, on the instructional side, the significant amount of support and expertise that is needed when there is um, corrective action or improvements needed to be made. So we'll kick it to Dr. Griffin first, and then um, if we have additional team members okay. that want to can you can. ask that question again so I'm really clear in case I need some additional So support. I guess the question is, you know, because the way it's put on our agenda, kind of where we're talking about it, like what is our authority, our ability um, as if we, let's say we would, uh, would approve, we vote to approve them into our network. Mm -hmm. So if they did not meet any standards, whether it's academic, financial, operational, who has the ability to sanction or close? Would it be us as, a, as the local education agency authority or is it the mm -hmm. state? So I guess, you know, kind of pulling on what Ms. People Walker said, is our authority just technical as a way we share information, how we share processes, whether it's IT, benefits or whatever? Right. Or is there actual, do we have actual authority or responsibility if they don't meet standards, if they don't meet criteria, if they don't meet benchmarks, so who has the ultimate we, responsibility? So with, with the restating of that question, Melissa, we might want to get to. Because I was going to the school performance framework. Right. Sorry, okay. I, think, I think out loud. So. I do the same thing. Uh, by statute, we can revoke their charter. There is a similar appeals process, and that has also previously been overturned. But we do have, as the authorizer, the ability to revoke their charter. Okay. To answer your question, yes. Okay. Yeah. So we would be the authorizer in that? I thought the state would be the authorizer. The state would only be the authorizer if you all vote for them not to be in the MMDS oh, So then family. we would actually have oversight of them. Correct. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes. Oh, so we have to evaluate them and everything. Correct. Okay. Okay. Well, that was a good question. Actually, that better. was a great That's question. better for us. In my opinion. <laughs> Ms. Masters, were you done, Mrs. Play Player? No, I'm done. Yes, I'm done. Thank you. Ms. Masters. Yeah, I guess, I guess yeah, this count, just to recap. <laughs> so our board decided not a good fit for us. Um, I agree after having reviewed the initial application. The state overrules us, and now we're thinking about saying, oh, okay, fine, you overruled us, so we'll, we'll take you into the fold and, and let you be a part of what we're doing. And we're talking a lot about oversight, However, um, it, it is my understanding that um, we don't have as deep a level of oversight of charter schools as we do of our other schools. Um, we don't have the power, even if they are a part of the MNPS system, to hold them to the same standards of accountability. Um, and in many cases, the teachers who work within don't receive the same benefits and protections 
um, as our MNPS employees. And, I, and I'm, I'm deeply concerned by that. Just, you know, the thought that, you know, it's, it would be up to KIPP still to determine which benefits they're gonna offer to their teachers and which they aren't. And so I just wanna get some clarification and, you know, as we're talking about oversight something magical hasn't happened since I last <laughs> began to, to deepen my understanding about charters where we actually do have oversight of charter schools at the same level as we do of our traditional schools or am I, am I misunderstanding and yes, we finally get to like help them do the thing. So I wanted to make two points of clarification. The first is this is what's known as a reconciliation period after the state board's decision. And so MNPS has to decide that we want KIPP in the fold and KIPP also has to decide. Based on conversations with KIPP, they are open to it. Um, they haven't made a firm decision one way or the other. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear that this decision tonight, there's still another party that has to agree. The second part of your question was, and I've lost it, could you? Just just truly trying to dig in on the actual the level, level of, of oversight. oversight. Charter schools are designed to be relatively independent. So our oversight comes in in terms of if something comes up about um, exceptional education students going in and seeing if they are serving those, what their student teacher ratios are. Um, but it's more high level than down into the weeds. So we wouldn't set we wouldn't set salaries, benefits for teachers or anything like that. Thank you. Yeah, that that was one of my big concerns. Absolutely. And then also, you know, should we magically come up with some amazing way to more qualitatively evaluate um, student success? It, it's it's not going to have any effect on our charter schools because they're still going to evaluate the way they want when it comes to student. Okay. Thank you. Quick point of clarification. Ms. Kelly, sorry, sorry, I'm going to just interrupt real quick. And I meant benefits. I meant like sometimes charter schools. Microphone. Microphone. Um, microphone. <laughs> this mask thing, okay. The new normal. Um, I was just saying how some charter schools um, put, our, put their employees on Metro benefits and then they pay for those things. That's what I meant by access to that. Yes. And I just want to do a point of clarification. Um, charter office, uh, would you come back up, please? I'm sorry. Um, Mr. I just, Thomas. I just wanted to get some clarification surrounding your question. When it comes to our charter schools and oversight, when it comes to grades, when it comes to um, um, their performance, what does the charter office do? If they are low performing charters, there are expectations of our charter schools uh, when it comes to uh, academic performance. Is that right? Each year we uh, complete an academic performance framework in the areas of academic uh, operations and financial. And we look at all three areas and grade them according to a scale that the state has published. Uh, if there is one that is low performing, we would do uh, a notice of concern or a letter of deficiency and put them on a support plan where we're visiting the school uh, to be able to see that they're making improvements. I just wanted to make sure with Ms. Masters, I know she had some questions about grading and things like that. So there are some oversight also when it comes to academic performance. We look at the, when we're talking about the academic performance framework, we're looking at the scores from 10 ready EOCs, ACT, uh, the information that we receive from the state. Right. And so when they do, when they're not performing and, and those type of uh, concerns go out to those charters, uh, that is something that they have to correct or they, okay, they have to correct those within a certain time frame. Uh, it, that would be listed in our notice of concern. Uh, and then uh, if, if they continued to fall below, then we would be bringing a, uh, that before the board to allow them to make the decision of opening or leaving it open or closing. Thank you. Any final remarks before I call for the question? Clear as mud. Ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Would you mind restating your motion, Mrs. Bush? Um, I would like to make, to make a motion to, um, to add, um, to approve um, KIPP Collegiate Prep High School to be a part of MMPS. And it was uh, motion improperly seconded by Ms. Rita Player-Peters. 
All right, all in favor, raise your hand. All right, all opposed? And then two absent, motion fails. Can I have another motion? To close out the okay, so discussion. Okay, so I guess I'm, I move to have the KIPP school be under the state, I mean, what's the best way? To be under state ownership. All right, do I have a second? Second. All right, all in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, that, that was so rude of me. Well, discussion. Point of order. Discussion. Should, should we yeah. state the motion of but, uh, two? Sorry. The, yes, probably. Default though that they go to the state? It goes to, the, it goes to, it so defaults we, to being a state run school anyway. But then we don't the need. Ah. Is that it goes Do you need to vote on it, I guess? Or it's, 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 gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna. No, we don't. Fail as well, I think. All right, <laughs> so we know that it defaults to become a member of the state portfolio. All right, thank you ladies for the discussion. Uh, before we go into announcements, under uh, previous or under the previous board chair, Mrs. Anna Shepard, God rest her soul, she um, we wanted to kind of streamline our board meeting, so we only had a director's report at the second board meeting of each month. But this is these are unprecedented times, so we get to make the rules in the new normal. Dr. Battle, I know you had a long day, but a great day. Would you like to make some remarks? Uh, Absolutely, before we close out? Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, board members, we were excited to welcome back students in grades pre-K through two to classes across our elementary schools today. It was an, a really exciting day. I saw a lot of smiling faces behind the mass of teachers, students, and parents as they lined up to go into the buildings for their first face-to-face -face learning experiences since we shut down in March of this year. It was almost a second first day of school. I even got to see some of our middle and high school principals at elementary schools going above and beyond to pitch in and welcome back students safely to classrooms. 10,066 students returned to class today with about 6,200 pre-K two students remaining virtual. Some students were meeting new teachers for the first time while others were getting to see someone they met virtually two months ago. Starting with a half day today and tomorrow will give our students an opportunity to adjust and will allow principals and their staff to review the success of their plans and make adjustments as needed to ensure that they're safe and they have efficient operations for each school. We have provided clear protocols to all of our school teams that will allow us to refine our practices as needed with new and updated information. As a district, we'll be working over the next week to analyze data, trends, and other information received from schools to ensure our plans are meeting the needs of all students and teachers as we move forward with the phase-in process. We're also continuing to monitor the trends of COVID-19 spread in the community, as well as working with the health department to track and monitor cases or potential cases in our schools. The latest numbers community-wide are concerning. And if they continue to trend in the wrong direction, it may require deeper discussion about the timeline for a phase in of students. That is why it is so critical that we all play our part, model good behavior and work together to practice the protocols that we know are most effective in reducing the spread of the coronavirus. Wearing masks, social distancing, washing our hands frequently and making responsible decisions with our health and the health of those around us at the top of our minds. If we all work together and look out for one another in these ways, we can ensure that a safe return to school is possible for every student and family who wants, who wants it. So thank you, Madam Chair, for a few minutes to provide an update. Um, again, today was our first half day of school for our pre-K two students, and we're looking forward to a continued phase in and welcoming more students back over the next few weeks. Thank you so much. All right, we'll go into uh, committee reports from governance with Mrs. Pupo Walker. Um, we um, passed um, a revision to a slight uh, language revision to board policy 6.304 on student discrimination, harassment, bullying, cyberbullying, and intimidation. Um, a unanimous consent, and that was the full and sum total of our activities in that meeting. All right, thank you very much. And in that vein, I wanna go ahead and discuss outcomes from our most recent board retreat, and to go ahead and let you all know that we will be having another one, likely in December. We'll talk about dates and times. I'll send you all a few. Feel, please feel free to let me know. I wanna make sure I give you all plenty of, uh, plenty of notice so you don't plan any vacations. 
but we were excited to talk through committee chairs because we will be using the committee system a lot more uh, efficiently this year, I hope. So I'm so excited to announce that budget and finance chair this year will be Mrs. Frida Player Peters with Vice Chair Rachel Ann Elrod. Uh, capital needs under the same bucket of work will be chaired by Mrs. Uh, Tyler with Vice Chair Frida Player Peters. Thank you all for the work you'll be doing, mainly with Mr. Henson, but for sure to make sure we connect well with the council and mayor to make our needs known. Um, director's evaluation, ah, and I must uh, pause for just a second and please you know, let the community know to please keep uh, Dr. Verthina Nabal McKinney in your thoughts and prayers. She unfortunately lost two close family members back to back, one to COVID, ironically. So please keep them in your prayers, especially as they travel to go be with family and to remind our community that this is not a hoax. We are in these tough discussions because this is a real pandemic with real people losing their lives. But let me step back down off that soapbox. She will be our director's evaluation chair. During the retreat, she and vice, uh, yeah, she and vice chair, Mrs. Rachel Ann Elrod, uh, this, got together to kind of discuss and map out an evaluation format and evaluation plan for our director, uh, Dr. Adrian Battle. We'll also be looking to think through the strategic planning, um, rebuilding or you know, amending the framework over the next year and a half, potentially two years. Again, something that came from that retreat. If you've never been familiar with our strategic plan, please find it on the website. Just go to search strategic framework and it will pop up for you. Um, governance chair will, is, of course, Mrs. Jeannie Pupo Walker, and the uh, vice chair again, Dr. Nabal McKinney. Naming of schools remains uh, Mrs. Rachel Ann Elrod, with teaching and learning uh, chair being Abigail Taylor, uh, Tyler, I'm so sorry, uh, Mrs. Abigail Tyler, and vice chair, Dr. Nabal McKinney. Advocacy chair, which I'm sorry you all have your work cut out for you, but I surely appreciate you, especially as we look to, do, to make known to the community the different implications of passing the referendum, making sure that they understand what a 25% cut in our budget would do to our littlest learners, to our youngest citizens, our people, our teachers, our system. Um, so we have Mrs. Uh, Masters chairing and Mrs. Player Peters vice chairing. I think her relationship with the budget committee will also help. Insurance trust, so much fun, me, Mrs. Masters and Mrs. Bush. Sick leave bank will be Mrs. Masters and Mrs. Bush. And then um, we have a few, we sit on a few different boards. I won't make those different announcements, but I've already spoken to the different uh, committee persons that will join those groups. I want to make one last request. Any, anyone, t anyone chairing any kind of relationship building organization, TSBA, NSBA, Q, Council of Great City Schools, in the future, we will be looking to have some sort of um, review of what's discussed in those conversations, those emails, just to make sure we're abreast of best practices, we know of any conferences coming up to make us the strongest, most efficient system that we can be. So thank you all so much for accepting these chair, chair and vice chair positions. We really do appreciate it. With that said, thank you all so much for your time tonight. We're gonna start with announcements. Mrs. Pupo Walker, would you mind leading us off? Would love to. I wanna start by, um, recognizing and sending thoughts and prayers to Gary Hughes, Principal J.T. Moore. His mother passed away from COVID this morning. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just a reminder. Um, it's just, just the real deal, so we're here. Um, so we're thinking about him and, and his entire family. Um, I also wanna just say I was really glad to see public participation back. Uh, it feels like we're back in the town square and that's important to have voices heard here. And I love seeing students. I loved hearing a student speak today. I thought that was great. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know we had a conversation, I don't even know anymore. August. August, July, um, about having a student school board member. So I am, uh, Ms. Bugs is uh, allowing me to form an ad hoc committee to look through what that process will look like. We'll have some community stakeholders help us think about a timeline and process so we can have a sitting school board member, we'll have to make room here um, for next school year. So excited about that. And then I also wanted to acknowledge and celebrate uh, a Hillsborough student, Alora Young, an IB student, who was published over the weekend in the New York Times um, in a Young Black Poets project in a special section called The Future of Poetry in 10 Poems. And I'm gonna just read a short piece because it's so powerful. I'll try not to get emotional. 
Black womanhood is being asked to bring gifts to parties you were never invited to. It's lighting everyone's candles with the fire alight in you. It's standing in solidarity with women who didn't fight for you because you know that what oppression feels like. And I think that God just might love like black women do. My great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother was a slave. She took thoughts of freedom to her unmarked grave. Her daughter stood alongside sisters for rights that would never be hers in a lifetime. Revolution is embedded in my bloodline. She shouldn't have dreamed what this next century brought in. The law in the hands of Justice Jane Bolin, the first judge in this country to be a black woman. Changing a future she would never see, every vote we cast should honor her memory. Cast your ballot like that candle burning with ancestral flame. It is the legacy they fought for. Let them see what became of the children of the country of the women who got the chance to have a name. Thank you for that. I'm done. Thank you. Mrs. Bush. Thank you. Um, I want to first and foremost thank all the um, per, uh, participants that participate in public uh, participation. Um, I also uh, would like to um, uh, say that I'm really excited to see our youngest learners back in school. This is such a, um, a, t a pressing time for those students, and I'm so glad to see them. Those that want to be uh, families want their kids in person, that they have that opportunity and choice. Um, on a, a different note, um, I just want to caution um, this board um, and the chair. Uh, when we're making decisions um, to um, say and put out in the atmospheres that um, that board members can't visit their schools, we need to be very careful. Uh, the constituents of this city knows that we are elected officials. We are elected officials and we serve the people. We do not serve the director or her teams. We are elected officials and we have the right to go into our school buildings um, safely. Uh, we breathe the same air and we are from the same community that our students are in. And it's only eight, nine board members and we should never ever be um, given some, an alternative or a, a demand that we are not allowed in our schools. So I wanna make sure I caution in the future of making that type of decision because we are elected officials and we serve the people. Um, as far as planning, um, we heard a lot of that tonight as far as poor planning and how this process worked for our students um, and our families. Um, a lot of things that happened over these um, last couple of months um, shouldn't have happened. Um, and I have always said it, I've, made a, I've had a conversation with Dr. Battle about the planning and I continue to stay firm that we had poor planning during out this process. Um, when we lose almost close to 7,000 students, I think that um, we can, this is a picture, this is a vision of how we didn't get it right. To lose that many students, it was, we've never had that happen before. And it's not because of COVID, it was because of poor planning. And that's my announcement. Thank you. Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. So um, though I understand that the school year looks different for everybody, whether it be it your children are uh, returning as our pre-K through K students uh, in person today, or whether they're continuing virtually like my own, um, we still have parent-teacher conferences coming up, y'all. So don't forget that parent-teacher conferences are on October 23rd um, at Overton and other schools. And additionally, I wanna make sure that um, if you're in the Creep Hall area, um, we host, uh, my family hosts, so if you're in the Southeast Nashville, you're welcome to come, um, an annual holiday event for 4th of July and for Halloween. We usually um, do those in person, but we're not this year. So we're really trying to get out the message, do not show up at Ellington Ag on Halloween, y'all, because uh, <laughs> there's been some confusion. So instead, we're gonna be posting things about the scavenger hunt and we hope that you can participate. And of course, if you're not in our district or not in my area, it's really open to any neighborhood. And so I hope you participate and everybody stay safe so we can continue some in-person learning. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Player Peters. Um, yes, I want to send my condolences out to a constituent of mine, Mrs. O'Neill. Um, she lost a three-year-old um, relative to COVID, um, and so she wanted me to express that. So I just want to send my condolences to her. I've been in conversations about that. Um, she wanted to come here to speak tonight, but um, just acknowledging that tragedy in her family. Um, two, um, 
employees, um, go get your flu shots. I got mine today, Bugs Bunny, here at Brands for, well, I don't know where the front of the building was, that way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I went to the front of the building today at one o'clock, got my free flu shot, so I'm asking all employees here at Brands for Avenue, um, tomorrow the 14th, on Monday the 19th, you can go online and sign up for an appointment. It literally took me less than 10 minutes to do it, so please encourage you to stay healthy. I know all the employees are worried about their safety, so take that proactive measure. Is it benefit that you offer? That's free. Just show your license and your appointment, and it was free to do. So I encourage you to do that. And then also um, on Saturday, November 7th, the Judge Allegra Walker is having an oratorial contest open to all high school stooler, school high schoolers. Um, at 10 a.m. be held virtually. The first place prize is $150. Um, and you can contact um, Margaret Nevels, 615-880-3694, 615-880-3694. I'll be one of your judges. So just hopefully our high school students can participate in that um, as part of this one of the activities going on. And the topic, really important. Good trouble in a troubled world. Um, so you can go to my Facebook page, Frida, at, at, at Frida for Schools um, for information too. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Masters. I just want to be sure that we publicly acknowledge that our colleague, Ms. Jeannie Pupo Walker, was oh, yes. awarded the Distinguished Alumna Award from Nashville Public Education Foundation. I don't think we've met since that happened. So um, just want to give, give you a round of applause for that. Aww. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. I was actually gonna, I was gonna say the same thing. So um, I guess in that vein, we'll also go along the rest. Um, I know that one of my district teachers, Nikki Healy, was awarded the Annette S. Eskind Inspiring Educator Award. And I think that's a big deal. We need to make sure that we are acknowledging when our teachers are going above and beyond and when they are putting their all into it and um, letting them know how much we appreciate them, especially now. Thank you so much. I just want to reiterate my appreciation for my colleagues and for the staff that were able to join us at our first board retreat. I think we had a lot of great discussion. It was open to the public. Anyone could have joined us, and I'm so glad that you all did. Like I said, we will be using the committee system a bit more efficiently to kind of streamline some of this work and to have some of those broader discussions so that we don't have our staff, some of whom are parents, here in the boardroom with us, you know, at. Um, inappropriate times of the evening when we know they need to be home preparing for the next day. So I just appreciate you all talking through that. Um, I want to reiterate our congratulations to every person that was awarded um, anything at the MPF, at the Nashville Public Education Foundation Hall of Fame. I mean, we have old MNPS employees like Mr. Ward, who was a principal at Hume Fogg when I was at MLK, like my colleague, Jeannie Pupo Walker, um, like a former colleague at, with Gear Up, Miss Amanda Darty, who has had a child at East High School. I mean, I just love the connectivity of this city. I love that we have, we are finding better ways to elevate the good work that's happening in this system so that we don't continue to hear just the negative stories. We know we have things to work on, but we appreciate the people doing the work. I, of course, have to shout out my Tennessee State University uh, alum, family and friends, the Slim and Huskies boys, Clint, EJ, and D Derek Moore. We just appreciate the work that they do because they partner so readily with MNPS. Um, I do want to elevate one, uh, a podcast that I've been listening to lately. I, I mentioned at the board retreat that I, I listened to the New York Times podcast, Nice White Parents, and then it was suggested to me that I listen to The Promise, which was filmed right here in Nashville. It covers uh, Casey Holmes, you know, a school in my district and his partnership with the area schools, and I appreciate Maribel Knight for getting the, the constituents or the neighbors in those, in those areas to really talk about their experience with the city and how those city issues bubble up in schools. And so if you haven't heard it, please give it a listen. It's so interesting. It features children, it features parents, it features teachers and administrators. Again, just the connectivity of the city and getting out, um, getting out the true stories, the stories of the people on the ground. 
I also want to acknowledge that, yes, we have two rallies that were going on when we pulled up today, and I really do appreciate that community members are engaging in the, the civic process, that they are making sure that they reach out to us. So we want to hear from you. We are certainly empathetic to every issue, every need, every concern, so please continue to reach out to us. But I also want to elevate the, the idea that this is still a pandemic. This is still uh, an unfortunate time to be making decisions. So to my colleagues, to, my, to our staff, to Dr. Battle staff, we appreciate that it is so uncomfortable to be in this seat, to, make, to be the one tasked with making the decision, but we're doing it. We're making the hard choices, we're making the tough calls, so we appreciate the grace that's being offered from our schools and our teachers and our students and our families. We will continue to support you however we can. I also appreciate that some of our more affluent neighbors are beginning to speak up about equity because they see or at least are finally feeling uncomfortable and they want to elevate the uncomfortability for their less, or better yet, their more disenfranchised neighbors. I just ask that you all keep that same energy. Maintain that when it's budget, budget season. Remember that when it's time to cut something from your school in the name of equity, to make sure that you might have to lose a strings teacher for another student to have a math teacher. You might have to lose one bus route for another student to get fed. So I appreciate that and I want us to continue to push that mes message out. I could talk for hours about just the unprecedented nature of this time, but I know y'all wanna go home, so I appreciate you. Be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.